chapter 2. I alluded to this last week in, uh, in, a, in what we're going to study. I think it's kind of uh, important to realize these things are here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says in verse 10, it says, But God hath revealed them, and that's the things that, that no man can know in verse 9. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And uh, certainly what we've been studying in the past when we talked about the angels that sinned, and now that we're studying about the spirits in prison, uh, these are, would be included in those deep things of God, but God has revealed some of those things, and, and we're going to be looking at them, and sometimes there's, uh, it brings up more questions than answers, sometimes it brings up more, more confusion than understanding, uh, but at the same time, there are things in the scriptures that, uh, that are said so that we, uh, we could label them the deeper things of God and go ahead and understand them and, and not be afraid of, of not coming to conclusions or not understanding everything perfectly. Uh, so, First Timothy, uh, no, First Peter, chapter three is where our study is at. We introduced it last week by showing you the whole context of First Peter, because we're actually in our study. Our study begins in verse eighteen of First Peter, chapter three. First Peter three eighteen says, "For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust." that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was prepar uh, preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And then verse 21, the like figure, and we're not going to go into the, the figure that he talks about in in the, the baptism that now saves. That's our next whole series that we'll talk about. But the question comes up, even before you get to the baptism that now saves, is this preaching to the spirits uh, in prison. And what is that all about? And, and there's really two main, there's, actually, there's three different ways of looking at the verse, actually two main ver ways of looking at it. One is just a little bit of variance on the other. Uh, but we're, we're going to study that and, and look at it. I'm going to share you a couple different ideas, one at a time, though. Uh, when we did it, when we introduced it last week, we were pointing out that the whole, the whole vision or the whole uh, subject in 1 Peter is the suffering, especially of the kingdom saints preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ to set up the kingdom. Peter is preparing them for the suffering of the tribulation. And that's why in the verses just above that, he talks about, uh, like in verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you're going to suffer, suffer for the Lord. <laughs> Don't suffer because you deserve it. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's talking about obeying governments and all, and then if you have to suffer as a result of that, go ahead and suffer. And Christ is the example. That's why verse 18 says, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the, uh, the just for the unjust. So he was just, and he was dying for the unjust, and his death, his execution, was unjust in that he was just, but they found him guilty anyhow, but he had a purpose in dying, and he died for, for doing the will of God, not for doing something evil. And so he becomes the example of the kingdom saints, and we can apply it to us as well, that we, if we face suffering, we ought to face it doing the will of God, than certainly breaking laws and deserving the, the suffering we experience. So Christ is the example of that. But in talking about the example of that, Peter goes far beyond Jesus Christ dying. And he, he goes on in verse 18 saying, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by whom, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometime disobedient and so forth. So that when we looked at this passage, we said what we needed to do is figure out the who, how, when, where, what. <laughs> and actually I broke that down into saying that we need to figure out who preached to whom, how, when, and where was it preached, and then finally, what was preached? And you, you, have to, you have to get the other things down before you can either, because it, what he preached is going to certainly be a speculation, 
but who he preached to is going to be important to what he preached. And uh, so we, we need to work on it just in that order. Who preached to whom, how, when, where was, where was, where, uh, was it preached, and then, then we can talk about what was preached. So we introduced the chapter last time, got down to that question. Remember in, even in verse 18 when it said, once suffered for sins, we're talking about that Jesus Christ one time for all time, for all mankind, uh, past, present, and future, and uh, took, took our sins and suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust. He only needed to die one time to accomplish it all. So that, that was the, the importance of that. 18 is not really, verse 18 is, is not hard to understand. Uh, but it is interesting how verse 18 ends. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, uh, that, he might be, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So that the question I start out with today is, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Come with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and just in verse 17, it says, He says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ is already saying before he's crucified that no man's going to take his life. And unless Jesus Christ on that cross said unto the Father, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, and he gave up the ghost, he willed himself to die. He, he gave his life. And uh, I've told you my testimony to my, my dad as I go back in my youth and try to figure out exactly when did I understand the cross. I remember that time where I asked him, if Jesus Christ was God, why didn't he just come down from the cross and kill everybody? And th the whole point is here. He was giving his life, and he gave his life for me. He died and paid for my sins. And that's the day I understood what Jesus Christ did on the cross in my behalf. And I thanked him that night for it and put my trust in his death, burial, and resurrection for my salvation. So that, so, but that's what the Lord's declaring here. No man takes his life. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. He gave himself, the Bible says, a ransom for all. And, and he, but he also says, I have the power to lay it up, uh, to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received my Father. So in, in one sense, Jesus Christ is claiming that he's going to raise himself from the dead. He's going to lay down his life, and he's going to take it up again. So in, in that respect, it looked like Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. Most of the time... Uh, some like there's like 17 verses that refer to God the Father raising him from the dead. You're, you're in John, so just flip over to Acts chapter uh, 1. No, Acts chapter 2. There's several, but you're close to this one. So Acts chapter 2. It talked about in verse 23. Does him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised from the dead, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So real clearly, you know, the declaration is God raised him from the dead. Just kind of jumping over to chapter 13 where the Apostle Paul is teaching. He says in verse 30, he talked about uh, that it was uh, that they found no fault in him. Uh, they desired him to be slain. Verse twenty nine says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. So the testimony of scriptures, some 17 times, it's a reference. And when I say God, just for the sake of it, Galatians chapter 1, Paul will actually declare God the Father. Galatians chapter 1. Very first verse. 
says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Jesus Christ said, I take up my life again. And then the, the majority of verses talk about God, referring to God the Father, raising Jesus Christ from the dead. But then that passage that we're looking at in, indicates that God the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Uh, again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive, by the Spirit. And it, it, it's implying that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Now, there's something interesting about that. There was a couple things that are interesting about that. Hold your place there and look at Romans 8. There is a close parallel between a lot of the things that are said in Peter in 1 Peter, with the things that Paul's teaching about life in Christ and, uh, and about Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verse 10 says, but if, but if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now that's Naturally, God has put His Spirit of life in us, and that's the Holy Spirit Himself, which is also the Spirit of Christ. Verse 11 says, But if the, the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So, if, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead uh, dwell in you. So that's certainly... The Spirit of Him would be the Spirit of God, but it's a reference to the Holy Spirit as you continue to read. Uh, that, uh, Raise up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Um, therefore, we're not debtors to the flesh, to live after the flesh, and then so forth. So, the, the, the indication, it uses the same kind of illustration here about us, that, that Jesus Christ being raised by the Spirit of God and us being identified with that death, burial, and the life of Christ. You have it in 1 Peter chapter 3, after he talks about being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 1 of 1 Peter, it says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he, hath, he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And that's what Paul's talking about. We're dead to sin. And Peter uses almost the same type of thinking, understanding that that, that identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has put away sin forever. Again, verse 18, uh, he once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust. Now, the reason I, I bring up the fact that when you look at that, you can kind of study and realize the importance of the Trinity, that if, there's, if the Trinity isn't the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit making up the Godhead, then, then you would have to figure out, okay, if they're not one in the same, then who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Because you have, you know, God the Holy Spirit, you got God the Son, and you got God the Father all participating in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the reason, I, like I said, why I said that is I believe that verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 3 is stated that way, quickened by the Spirit, for the sake of, of leading into verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So that he brings up the fact that he's quickened by the Spirit, made alive by the Spirit, in order to tell us about how it is that Jesus Christ went and preached to the spirits that are in prison. Uh, so whether we, before we go any further, when it talks about by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, there's no doubt that the first part of our question, who preached to whom? The first part is who. And there's no doubt it's the Lord Jesus Christ who did the preaching. Uh, now we, the, it gets a little bit more complicated, a little deeper than that, but the, first of all, who's doing the preaching? Jesus Christ is doing the preaching. Now some of you might know that there's other ways of looking at the passage, but no matter how you look at it, the, 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 the verse is real clear in verse 19 that if the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, by whom, uh, by which also he, the Lord Jesus Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So that's real clear in the passage. 
What's not clear in the passage is how we're to understand that. <laughs> the, the, what the passage says is clear, but how to interpret the passage is, is a little bit unclear because there's different ways that you can look and see how did Jesus Christ do that. But we're going to work our way to, who, uh, to how he did it. But the, first, the next question we need to start working on is to whom did he preach? And the Bible says to the spirits in prison. Now the question has to come up is that the spirits uh, of uh, speaking about those angels that sinned, which, by the way, that's why we studied that, that whole study, the angels that sinned, because there was something in this passage I was looking at that related to that. <laughs> and so we studied all that just to get to this point. And, and the question is, the spirits in prison, are they the angels that sinned that we've been reading about in, in 2 Peter uh, and, and in, in the book of Jude? Or are they non-believers of Noah's day? And that, that interpretation we're going to get to another time, but we need to ask that question right now. The who, to whom did he preach? It's the spirits in prison, but are those angels that sinned, or are they non-believers of Noah's day? And whichever conclusion you come to will change how Jesus preached to them, when he preached to them, where he preached to them, and certainly what he preached to them. If you think it's the angels that sinned, it's gonna, we're gonna, it'll actually affect how Jesus preached to them and certainly when he preached to them and where he preached to them and then what he preached to them. If it's, the, if it's humans in Noah's day, how did Jesus preach to them? When did he preach to them? Where did he preach to them? And certainly what did he preach to them would be different. So whatever conclusion you come to on the whom is going to change how you look at the whole passage. Now, that, that gets me to, the, to a point that I wanted to say, and that is, as we come to this passage of Scripture and look at it and consider the spirits in prison, are they angelic or are they humans? Human spirits that are now in hell. Uh, so as we ask that question, it relates real closely to how we began our study in Genesis 6. Because I told you in Genesis 6, when it talks about the sons of God coming down to the daughters of men, that there's two ways of looking at that, that that's angelic interference with human beings. And, uh, and so there's that point of view. And then there's those who look at that and say, no, 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 it can't be that. That's got to be on a human level. That sons of God are, are the godly people of, of ancient days and the daughters of men are the wicked people of ancient days and they just came together. So you look at it, is there angelic interference? Is there angelic involvement? Or is it just all on a human level? Well, as we come to this passage, we're doing the same thing. We're asking us the same question as we asked back then. And I have to admit to you <laughs> that just like in Genesis 6, I told you I went back and forth about at least, three, at least two times on both sides <laughs> before I concluded angelic. This passage of scripture, I've been back and forth on. I looked, I don't even know what year that I preached in 1 Peter. But I looked on my notes, what did I teach back then? <laughs> I totally had forgot what I preached. And, uh, and what I'm about to teach you, I don't think I'm going to teach you as, as uh, uh, the same. Although I, I still have a, a little bit of open-mindedness on this passage. Although I have, a, just like the Genesis 6, I'm convinced Genesis 6, angelic interference. This passage, I'm not quite as convinced, but I lean toward uh, angels that sinned are the, are the spirits that are in prison. But, but the point is, is there's, it's interesting how those two come together here. Now, uh, I think the, the, as we talk about at this point, you're either going to go angelic or human in your thinking. Maybe, you know, when you come to a conclusion, you're going to come to one of those two. But I think the reason that, that most people pick the human part rather than the angelic part, for a large portion the reluctancy to accept the angelic interpretation is because of the ignorance of the rebellion and perhaps even of the existence of creatures in the universe, especially in the fact that those creatures, other creatures in the universe have crossed paths with the visible world that we live in. And uh, I think there is a lot, of, a lot of ignorance about that rebellion not, maybe not so much ignorance about other creatures, like angelic creatures, but the fact that there are times that they cross paths. I mean, we did a whole study uh, on demon possession or, you know, devils possessing bodies and stuff. So certainly they crossed paths back then. 
So even pe where, why people are reluctant to, to acknowledge that, the Bible is full of that information. And, uh, and then there's the ignorance of God's secret plan for the body of Christ to reconcile the heavens to himself. And because of all that just reluctancy to go with the angelic and understand some of the angelic and, and that involvement and maybe the crossing paths, it's easier just to make the passage all about humans. And, and, and I, think that, I think for the most part that's why most people will go that direction. Although it is interesting to me, and I, I've read all kinds of commentaries where even non people that don't know right division, I think right division is the, the answer to open up your eyes that there's more than just us humans and God's purpose for heaven and earth is not just human beings on earth. Uh, but even people that don't understand the revelation of the mystery and the purpose of the body of Christ and maybe even don't even believe those things, when they study this passage, because of the, the information that's here, many of them do understand that, that the, the spirits in prison are angelic creatures. So anyhow, uh, I was surprised to find that out. Um, and, and there was, anyhow, I, I better not even go there. I was going to say, many of them do word studies. And the conclusion they come to is based on word studies. And we don't necessarily base uh, the context is, is how you're supposed to study something. But anyhow, uh, what I intend to do from this point on is to teach both interpretations. You might see leaning one way more than another. But I'm going to teach those two interpretations separately. I'm not going to try to talk a little bit here and then a little bit over here. I'm going to teach one all the way through. There might be a couple references to the other viewpoint, but not much. I want to teach them separately, and I'm going to begin with the angelic point of view, since that's mostly the one that's disregarded. And, uh, and it certainly would be easier just to teach it on a human point of view. So let's look at again verse 19, and now we're going to start, and I'm going to, as, as we say, we can either go angelic or human. Verse 19 says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometimes disobedience when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So it starts out with, uh, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And that by which takes us back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where it declares him to be quickened by the Spirit. By which? So it's by the Spirit or even like in the Spirit, in this resurrected spiritual form that Jesus Christ took on in resurrection. It was in Spirit and then you see immediately, you talk, it ends with quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached to the spirits. You got Spirit to Spirit and there, there's a connection there. Uh, even the word also, and I was pointing this out last week, not only does it say he was but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. And that also has to do with he's quickened by the Spirit. And, and when, I, when I talked about being what it meant to be quickened by the Spirit, it, it's not only that he was raised by the Spirit of God, but he was raised with a spiritual body. Last week we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it talked about Jesus Christ. And he said, there it says, uh, there is a, a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And Jesus Christ in resurrection, the Bible says, became a quickening spirit. And it doesn't mean he's a spirit in resurrection. It, the, the point of those passages, he was raised with a different kind of body that he came with. Again, look at verse 18. Put to death in the flesh, quickened by the spirit. It, there's a comparison of the body that he died in and the body that he was raised in. And 1 Corinthians is very clear, he was raised in a spiritual body. And a body that could travel in outer space, a body that could appear before God the Father and come back to earth, a body that could walk through a wall but eat a fish when he got inside the wall. So, so you realize that this resurrected body is not the same kind of body that Jesus Christ died with, but it's a body nonetheless, it's not a spirit. He said that Luke 24, they thought they saw a spirit. He said, I'm not a spirit, as you suppose, seeing that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. So he had some kind of flesh, but it's spiritual flesh. And he had some kind of bone structure. 
Uh, the, the question is, that probably had no blood in that, as it's probably the Spirit of God, the Spirit of life that flowed through his veins. But anyhow, the, the point is, is there is a statement here about quickened by the Spirit, which, by which also he went and preached. So he, when it says that he went, by also he went, the idea there is he raised and he went somewhere. As you connect those two verses, he went. Jesus Christ went to preach where spirits are. And that's verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And, and so when he went, when he was raised and went somewhere, he preached to the spirits in prison. Now here's where uh, some leverage really comes in. The term spirits in your Bible is primarily in Scripture speaking about angelic creatures. Um, we, we've already spent some time talking to them, so I don't even have to, to prove any point to you. Man has a spirit, but man is a soul who possesses a spirit and a body. And the kind of body we have now certainly is not going to be the same kind of body we're going to have in resurrection. But when the Bible speaks about spirits, plural, 46 times at least, it speaks of that 42 of those times, it's always a reference to angelic type of creatures. And you, you realize I'm just using that as a term speaking about angels. Uh, it, it, it's used in all the ways that we've studied in the past. When it talks about spirits, it's the spirits, or familiar spirits, or unclean spirits, or evil spirits, or wicked spirits, spirits of devils. All those expressions, every time they're angelic type of creatures, we call them demons, devils, the Bible calls them, but the, those are the terms the Bible uses. There's only four exceptions, and those four exceptions, there's twice in Numbers that it refers to God being the God of all spirits. So that would include man, but it would include <laughs> all that have the breath of life or the life of God in them. Uh, Hebrews, might as well turn there, just go back to Hebrews chapter 12. It's used twice here. Hebrews 12 and verse 9 says, Furthermore, when we had our fathers... I'll wait for you to get there. Hebrews 12, 9. Furthermore, we had our fathers of the flesh... Uh, our fathers of our flesh which uh, corrected us, and, gave, and we gave them reverence, uh, shall we not much rather be subject unto the Father of spirits and live? Well, again, see, you, that's just a, a general phrase that, that God is the Father of all spirits. So that's kind of a general statement. The most, I guess, the closest is at the uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse uh, 22. So we're not come to Mount Zion, but we're coming to the heavenly Jerusalem. It says in verse 22, But we are come unto, uh, unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So now there's a, there's a reference that's tied in with man to the spirits, but that, that's the only one that would talk about man being spirits, and, and even that's an unusual way to speak about them. But the point is, it, it seems to suggest, as you study spirits in the Bible, that, that the word spirits in the Bible always refers to non-human spiritual beings unless otherwise qualified. And if so, then, the spirits that... that, uh, that that Jesus Christ went and preached to would have to be the angels that sinned back in 2 Peter and, and in the book of Jude. Just the way that that's used with no, there's no clarification uh, of spirits. He went and preached to the spirits that are in prison. The, the other start statement that I said, usually in your Bible, when you read a man, the Bible calls man a soul. God breathed into the nostrils well, he made man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into nostrils the breath of life, there's your spirit, and man became a living soul. When the Bible refers to man, we're, we're called a soul. Uh, you might recall when Rachel was in dying, when she was having uh, Benjamin. It says that she was having trouble in childbirth, 
it, it says, as her soul was in departing, for she died. Now, now think about that. I don't know if you thought about the triune part of man. Where does man go when he dies? Well, when man dies, his physical body gets put in a grave. His soul goes to a place of destiny. You've got that Luke 16. The beggar died, goes to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. So it goes to a place of destiny. But when the Lord Jesus Christ died, as well as it indicates in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the spirit of man goes back to God who gave it. He gave the spirit of life, and the spirit goes back to God. Even, I would think, the very spirit of life that God gave lost people, their soul is what's down in hell. So that when the Bible would speak about man, it doesn't call him a spirit, it calls him a soul. Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And God's going to hold every soul accountable. Uh, you're close again to Revelation chapter 6. I get asked all the time, is there conscious existence between death and resurrection? Well, Luke 16, both the beggar who uh, was in Abraham's bosom was conscious, but also the man, that uh, the rich man that lifted up his eyes in hell, he's also uh, conscious. Jim Pittman always corrects me. I didn't say lifted. He lift his... <laughs> I say it wrong somehow. You have to look at the verse, Luke 16. Anyhow, uh, Revelation chapter 6. It says in verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge? and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And so there's more suffering and more people going to be martyred during the tribulation than these early martyrs in the tribulation, but they're called the souls. And they're under the altar in heaven and they're asking questions, so they're certainly conscious. But my point in turning to you there is that they're referred to soul. Man is called a soul. He's not called a spirit in prison. He's called a soul. And so it seems like what we're reading over there in Peter is not about humans, but about angelic creatures. And we know there are angelic creatures that are locked away, reserved in everlasting chains of, 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 of judgment. Uh, until the, the judgment of the great day. So we've read those verses several times, and we know that that is true. We've studied that, and it seems like 1 Peter is talking about that. In fact, go to 1 Peter again, this time start in chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. <laughs> verse 22, See, seeing ye have purified your souls in, a, uh, uh, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another uh, with a pure heart fervently. So it keeps referring, Peter keeps referring to his writers as souls. Chapter 2 and verse 25 says, uh, For we are as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And, and it just keeps doing that through, through this. We get chapter 3 and verse 20, and then four, chapter 4 and verse 19. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as to a faithful Creator. So when it talked about humans, especially dying humans, their soul is, is what the reference is in the Scriptures. So that, that very statement over there in chapter 3 of 1 Peter in verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, the, the scriptures would lead you to believe that, that, is, that he went and preached to spirits that are, are now in prison. And, uh, and would not be so much that they were people in Noah's day who didn't believe Noah and ended up in hell uh, awaiting the great white throne judgment, but those fallen disobedient angels that we've studied already who came down to earth in Noah's day and, and uh, participated in that wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and, and not just the man, the beasts of the earth in Noah's day, 
and who were captured and chained during that time of the flood. And uh, that we assume that because we talked about how water seems to capture spirits, and certainly they have to leave bodies that they're into, and, and, and when we come to Second Peter, those angels that sinned, or as Jude said, those angels that left their first estate, they're chained, they're not free. So they've been captured and, and put away, and it seems like these spirits are those that are, were, are tied into that event. Now, that brings us to the how, when, and where. We got who, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the spirits in prison, and, and identified who those seemed to be. Uh, but then, how did he, did Jesus Christ preach to them? And so, in that verse 18, when he's put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by whom, verse 19, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. If those two phrases are referring to the humanity of Jesus Christ in his incarnation, that human body that he had, but quickened by the Spirit being his resurrected body, with a, raised with a spiritual body, the by which also he went and spe- preached unto the spirits in prison is that body that he had in resurrection. Now that's an important thought, because if that's the point of that verse, it also tells us when he preached. Because one of the, the teachings that, that it gets taught that I said uh, there, there's some that come real close is what they say is some people will say, yes, it's Jesus Christ who preached to the spirits that are now locked up in prison, and he did it between his death and his resurrection. We, we know when we study the Bible how he said to the thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And, uh, and, and then uh, the, the statement in, in Matthew chapter 12 in, in verse 40 there, that the sign of the prophet Jonah, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, so what some people have thought is, okay, when Jesus Christ died, and he's in spirit form between death and resurrection, that at that time he went and preached to the spirits in prison. And... Uh, I, I already told you, he already commended his spirit to the God the Father. Now his soul goes down into that place of paradise, but the connection between verses 18 and 19 would tell you that he didn't preach to the spirits in prison between death and resurrection. When it says, quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached, it's that resurrected body that he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He went to preach to them after he was raised from the dead. Now to me that makes a lot more sense because <laughs> there's not victory in what Jesus Christ accomplished until he rose from the dead. And, uh, and so, but a lot of people teach that he preached between his death and resurrection. In fact, I got an email where a guy wanted to know all about what did Jesus Christ do between death and resurrection. And he was alluding to this and I told him, I said, I don't think Jesus Christ preached to the spirits in prison between death and resurrection. It was after his resurrection. He wrote me back and said, well, I think i got a lot to think about. <laughs> and that, that was a while ago, too. Uh, but anyhow, the, the connection there is after his resurrection is when he preached, is by raised. And, and so now we know how he did it, by the Spirit, and when he did it, when he was raised in a spiritual body, and where did he preach to them? would be the other question that we were asking. And where he preached to them would be, would certainly the spirits in prison, if everything we're tying in, has to do with those angels that are chained in everlasting chains of darkness, that it would have to be somewhere in the netherworld, somewhere in the lower parts of the earth, or as when we studied before about the lowest hell, the deep as those angels refer, or the demonic beings referred to them, devils referred to them, that that would be where he wa- where the angels are chained, that's where he would have went to preach to them. Now, I came across something interesting, and to add complication to complication, <laughs> that someone had related the fact that the interesting statement that is being made here, if we're connecting those thoughts together, that he actually went to where those angels are chained and preached something to them, that that sounds like, and it has some similarity to Ephesians chapter 4. So hold your place here, go to Ephesians 4. Now the reason I said complication upon complication, I I think most people don't understand Ephesians 4.
Well, that's what I left out. My Ephesians 4 notes. <laughs> In Ephesians 4, verse 7, it says, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, Ephesians is explaining the purpose of the body of Christ, and that the gifts that were given, that you're reading about in Ephesians, it starts enumerating the gifts in verse 11, but verse 7 talked about he gave gifts to men, that he did that when he ascended far above all heavens, when he, when he ascended up into heaven. Uh, as it says in verse 10, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. And there's a reason that he ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And the, the idea there is God is going to fill the earth and the heavens with the glory of his Son. And, and Jesus Christ didn't give gifts to the body of Christ until it didn't just ascend to the Father's right hand, but it's when he ascended far above all heavens that he gave gifts to men. And that has to do with gifts to the body of Christ, not just on Acts 2 when he gave gifts to the, the 12 apostles. So there's two thoughts there about the giving of the gifts, but we want to look, not so much study about the gifts, I want to concentrate on the two things that he did. He ascended up on high and he gave gifts to men. So, verse 8 again, Wherefore when he saith, uh, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So this leading captivity captive, most people look at this verse and talk about this is when Jesus Christ, in his resurrection, took those that were in Abraham's bosom in the heart of the earth, because that's where it was, and the next time you read about paradise, Paul talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise, and now it's in heaven. And we know that today, if we're absent from the body, we don't go down into the heart of the earth, into a place of bo Abraham's bosom. We're absent from the body and present with the Lord. So most people take led captivity captive, meaning that he took those that were captive down in Abraham's bosom and led them into heaven. And, and that's not what the passage means. I understand that it's like when you don't understand a passage, you got an idea and most people latch on to that. The question I've studied and studied and studied is what in the world does that phrase mean? Lead captivity captive. <laughs> By the way, that is a quotation from Psalm 68. And that quotation is a reference to what God's going to accomplish for the nation of Israel and Paul makes an application to what God's accomplishing with the body of Christ. Israel, the, the, what God's accomplishing there is he's going to set his kingdom up on earth through the nation of Israel when he leads captivity captive. But Paul's relating it here to the purpose of the body of Christ that he might fill all things, and that has to do with leading captivity captive, that he might fill the heavens with the glory of Christ. So, not trying to get into too much, let me just... Take that phrase, lead captivity captive, led captivity captive, and just give you some ideas of what that means, just the, the actual wording of it. It means to lead those captured into captivity. So you're going to capture some people, and you're going to lead them into captivity. I, I think about those angels that sinned. They had to be captured, didn't they? And then they had to be brought into a place of captivity, the spirits in prison. And uh, that, that's what that phrase has to do with. To, to lead the prisoners into, unto imprisonment. See, it's not <laughs> freeing a bunch of people, they're captive here and then they're free up there. It has to do with an enemy. It take, it's like taking captive, taking people, capturing those people, and then leading them away to a place of captivity. Guantanamo. <laughs> that idea. It, it's to conquer and to carry away the enemy. 
Now, when, when, when God is going to do that for the nation of Israel, He's going to cleanse their land. He's going to take the enemy out of the nation of Israel and lead them away captive, and Israel will be blessed with all the blessings that God promised them. The passage in Ephesians has to do with God spoiling those principalities and powers in heavenly places, making a show of them openly, putting down that rebellion in heaven, by taking them captive, and they're going to be taken out of that place and brought into captivity, and then we're going to fill those heavens with the glory of Jesus Christ. And so my point is, is boy, they, they, there's something close, parallel here to what's taking place in, in 1 Peter. Only 1 Peter would have to do with what God's going to do for the nation of Israel. But it has that, that same understanding, that those spirits that are now in prison, and... Uh, uh, and, and the idea, like in Ephesians 4, 3, 4 here, that verse 19. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? That's Ephesians 4 and verse 9. The reference is there is that before Jesus Christ ascended, now when he ascended, verse 10, he, he that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he had a high... That's, I always relate that to Philippians, where God has highly exalted him, not just above man, not just to make him king of the earth, but over all the heavenly beings as well. But before he did that, Jesus Christ had to descend, or first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now that can be, there's, when you stay to study that phrase in the Old Testament, that can be a reference to the grave, that Jesus Christ came to earth, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and it, just could, it could just be a reference to his physical death. But if somebody tied it in here, and I thought, hmm, worth thinking about. He that descended, or he that, uh, he that descended is the same, oh no, verse 9 again. Now he that ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Is it possible that after his resurrection, because that's what Peter's talking about, certainly after his resurrection, he preached to the spirits that are in prison. Before he ascended far above all, all heavens, did he go down into the place where these spirits are in prison and say something to them? And that he descended not just to a grave, but to that lower part, the netherworld. Now the reason I say that, we're going to close with this. Go back to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 3. I'm going to skip what, we, what we're not going to study right now, but watch this. Start in verse 19. I'm going to read 19, 20, and then 22. First Peter chapter 3. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometime disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Verse 22, Who is gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. It doesn't just end where the world, earth, is subject unto him, but Peter acknowledging that the angels are now subject unto him. The same thought of Ephesians, ascended far above all heavens, and that, that the idea there is not just authority over the earthly creatures, but over the heavenly creatures, and those angels in prison might have got a, a tongue lashing <laughs> as, as his resurrection assures that is going to take place. And we got, I got more to say about that, but I wanted to tie that in and stop there for, for the day. God sir, has given us Revealed all things, yea, the deep things of God. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we, we thank you for the ability to, to think about and study these things out. And whichever conclusion we personally come to, we all know that we're not the only creatures you've created in the universe. And that your purpose, especially as we understand the purpose of the age of grace, is not just to make your son exalted above the earth, but certainly exalted above heaven and earth. And everybody, angelic or human, made subject unto him. Every knee shall bow and confess, whether things in heaven, things in earth, or things under the earth. 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. And we thank you that we've learned that already. Thank you for our study. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.